joining us from the World Wide Web. Um, you can ask your questions online. There's no reason to wait. If you already think you have the most devastating question to ask, you should start typing in. When it comes time for questions and answers, we'll alternate between taking some questions from uh, live and some questions from uh, the internet. Uh, welcome to the 10th annual Lester Kissel Lecture. I'm Arthur Applebaum, Director of Undergraduate Fellowships at the Edmund and Lilly Saffer Center for Ethics. And on behalf of the center's director, Daniel Allen, I have the most pleasant task of introducing our speaker, Professor Erin Kelly. But first, a few words about our dear Lester Kissel. Lester died in the year 2000 at the age of 98. He had been the managing partner of Seward and Kissel, a major Wall Street law firm specializing in financial law, representing banks, investment funds, and the like. In his early 60s, he started reading Hindu ethics and asked himself, is this all there is to life? This being a lawyer for big banks. He began going to India, even had a guru who taught him that reincarnation is real and that with sufficient study and work, he might come back as a worthy soul. Kissel's longstanding interest in values in public and professional life led to his commitment to the ethics initiative at Harvard, beginning with early conversations and correspondence with President Derek Bach, and later with President Neil Rudenstein and our center's founding director, Dennis Thompson. Lester would visit us in between his treks to India, and each time he would remind us rather oracularly to attend not only to ethics, but to values. And then he'd trot off again to India. In the fullness of time, Lester bequeathed to the Ethics Center a magnificent gift. I think Lester would have admired this year's Kissel lecturer and deeply respected Aaron Kelly's commitment to a more just and philosophically sound understanding of moral responsibility and legal punishment. After all, to believe in karmic reward requires grappling with theories of desert. In turn, I think Professor Kelly um, would have been touched by Lester's compassion for all living things including the human ones, despite our imperfections and failings. Erin Kelly is the Fletcher Professor of Philosophy up the road at Tufts University and a visiting professor here at Harvard Law School, but the Saffer Center's closeness to her is more than geographical. Erin earned her PhD in philosophy at Harvard and was a graduate fellow, and then later a faculty fellow at the Ethics Center. Erin, you could have collected them all had you been an undergraduate here, and you could have been an undergraduate fellow as well. One of my most thrilling experiences at Harvard happened around the Graduate Fellowship seminar table when Erin invited her mentor, John Rawls, to spend most of an afternoon discussing with the fellows the draft of what became the Law of Peoples. Erin was devoted to helping Rawls complete his later works after he fell ill. And without her sensitive and skillful editing of Rawls's Justice as Fairness, a restatement, that book might never have seen the light of day. Much more recently, Erin performed another remarkable feat of reconstruction. In researching her work on the criminal justice system, she met the renowned African-American artist Winfred Rember, a survivor of a near lynching and a Georgia chain gang who created vivid works of art in tooled and dyed leather, many depicting painful scenes from his life. Over several years of interviews, Rembert told Erin his story, which resulted in a book, Chasing Me to My Grave, an artist's memoir of the Jim Crow South, for which they won the Pulitzer Prize in biography last year. He, unfortunately, posthumously. These two works of selfless shepherding bracket Aaron Kelly's important and original work on criminal justice and responsibility. In many articles and in her 2018 Harvard University book, The Limits of Blame, Rethinking Punishment and Responsibility, Aaron has been developing a philosophical account of punishment that stands as an alternative to retribution. Aaron points out the extensive mismatch between criminal guilt and philosophically appealing conceptions of moral blameworthiness. Over 2 million people are imprisoned in this country, and a very large number of them have been deprived of freedom for actions that are not morally wrong, or for actions that are wrong but morally excusable on the usual excuses of impairment, ignorance, provocation, or duress. Erin writes, 
criminal conviction, people commonly believe, justifies condemning the convicted morally, stigmatizing and incarcerating them and denying them important benefits and opportunities upon release. In effect, permanently excluding them from membership in society. Instead, Aaron argues, when it comes to truly objectionable acts, considerations of public safety permit punishment. Still, we should resist the wider and often indiscriminate application of punishment to morally, conde to morally condemn persons. People who are not blameworthy for their morally objectionable acts do not deserve moral condemnation. In other cases, when moral blame might be warranted, it does not constitute per se a justifiable basis for punishment. This afternoon, Aaron will sketch for us an alternative justification for punishment that does not rely on the hard to defend claim that the punished deserve in any kind of deep way to suffer. That alternative called restorative justice is the idea that injured persons can heal together with the persons that have injured them. Please join me in welcoming Professor Aaron Kelly, whose lecture is entitled Restorative Justice. Thank you so much, Arthur, for that kind introduction. And many thanks to Danielle Ellen and the Sapper Center for inviting me. It's a true honor to give this Kissel lecture. Restorative justice brings to life the radical idea that injured persons might heal together with the persons who've injured them. I will be focusing on restorative justice as it's practiced in the United States. My aim is to draw a theory of restorative justice from its current practice and to make a case for the importance of restorative justice as a response to criminal wrongdoing. Restorative justice is an interpersonal reckoning with wrongdoing between two parties, a responsible party and a victim. A restorative justice conversation takes place in a structured and supportive group. In addition to the perpetrator, referred to as the responsible party, and the victim, referred to as the affected party, the parties include a mediator and sometimes family and other members of the community. If the process is a diversionary program within the criminal justice system, participants could include a representative from the police department or someone from the district attorney's office, though participation by law enforcement is controversial and many models don't include it. Participation, participants to a restorative justice dialogue sit in a circle. In other words, they're, they're positioned with respect to one another in a peaceful way. The responsible and affected party are each prompted to disclose the meaning and consequences the crime had for them and to negotiate an agreement about what the responsible party can do to redress the harm done. The mediator, often a trained volunteer, Facilitates the, facilitates the conversation to keep time equitably and to ensure that participants address one another respectfully. Meetings include an opening circle during which an agreement is drafted and sometimes a closing circle. Some models include additional meetings, sometimes over months. The restorative justice agreement the parties negotiate might require the responsible party to issue a formal apology or some other public statement or to undertake reflective writing, or to engage in community service. The responsible party may agree to re-enroll in high school, to seek treatment for substance abuse or anger, or to secure employment. Overall, the process focuses on acknowledgement, apology, and change, work the guilty party can do to redress harm done, and if possible, to reconcile with the victim. Restorative justice draws on an understanding of morality, according to which a person's conduct must be compatible with respect for the rights and interests of other persons, whose interests are no less important than one's own. Restorative justice conversations address wrongdoing in these terms by calling attention to the criminal actor's violation of the rights and interests of other persons as such. In this way, the requirements of morality are understood with respect to what persons owe to one another as equal members of society. This differs from a public policy that aims to promote the overall social good. The aggregate interests of society are important aspects of criminal justice, but they don't explain why what the wrongdoer has done was morally wrong. 
even if the prevalence of a certain kind of wrongdoing affects the urgency of criminalizing it. The focus of the restorative conversation is how the responsible party has wrongfully harmed other individuals or the community. The theory is that the responsible party's conduct has meaning for affected persons in a way that morally calls upon the responsible party for an appropriate response. Theories of interpersonal morality are, in contrast with the restorative approach, retributive in their orientation. They focus on the value of a punitive response to wrongdoing. They maintain that a punitive response is what the responsible party deserves. Retributivists argue that failure by the state to impose punishment amounts to failure to take wrongdoing or the victim's violation seriously. They maintain that the state owes it to the victim to punish the criminal wrongdoer. The idea of retributive justice is popular with moral philosophers and legal scholars. Some philosophers even reverse engineer the content of moral wrongness from ideas about the fittingness of punitive responses. My philosophical work presented in my book, The Limits of Blame, is critical of retributive thinking about justice, which I find troublesome in the context of the overly punitive American criminal justice system. The institution of American criminal law belongs to a compromised and fragile democracy with the history of gravely mistreating and othering its bottom caste groups, most especially Black Americans. Retributive justice in the American context risks aggravating unjustly punitive attitudes. I'm drawn to restorative justice because it offers an alternative to retributive thinking about justice. Restorative justice takes wrongdoing seriously without committing to a punitive response. It seeks acknowledgement and repair rather than punishment. This description of restorative justice is not uncontroversial. Some theorists think of restorative justice as belonging to a process that also includes retributive justice. In contrast, I will treat restorative justice as a distinctly non-punitive approach, even if it is not always practiced as such. There are important and unanswered questions about restorative justice. Some evidence is available that the practice of restorative justice reduces crime, but this result calls for further study both to confirm and to understand it. There are also important concerns about racial bias, both in the availability of restorative justice and its practice. And there are philosophical challenges to restorative justice, especially when it functions as an alternative to the more public nature of criminal trials. R. A. Duff has argued that the public nature of criminal accountability process of the criminal accountability process should not be diverted into a privately negotiated resolution. These are important questions and challenges, and I plan to take them up in the future. Today, however, I want to take up a different challenge, which I regard as pressing in view of the concerns that have led me to criticize the idea of retributive justice. The challenge I will consider is whether by focusing responsibility talk individually, and interpersonally, restorative justice threatens to ignore or even to legitimize institutional injustice. It is true that restorative justice is individualistic in this sense. The individuals who participate in a restorative justice dialogue are asked to take responsibility for their actions. Furthermore, as I've suggested, the focus of the restorative justice conversation is not what is best overall by some impersonal measure of harm reduction that may be relevant to a reform perspective. Rather, restorative justice explores the impact of crime on persons who were harmed by it. It may thus seem objectionably to abstract from a wider social context of unjust inequality, institutional abuses, and historical injustice, which contextualize crime and help to explain it. Restorative justice may seem to avoid engaging the relevance of social and institutional factors that mitigate individual responsibility. The personal and interpersonal focus of restorative justice conversations do, do avoid directly addressing matters of social and institutional 
injustice. They avoid addressing them directly. Still, I think the practice of restorative justice has potential to influence social and institutional change and that it has begun to do this by exemplifying the power and appeal of non-punitive responses to moral wrongdoing. Restorative justice in effect proposes a new paradigm for thinking about responsibility along two dimensions. The first concerns how accountability is conceptualized. That is what it means to hold someone morally responsible and what it is about a person that makes him or her eligible for the demands of moral redress. The second concerns how practitioners of restorative justice understand and address obstacles to accountability. I will address each dimension in turn. A restorative justice approach to accountability can best be understood in contrast with a retributive approach. Retributive justice takes the view that a person is responsible when she is blameworthy, and more specifically, when she's done something wrong and deserves a punitive moral response. To hold someone accountable through the practice of retributive justice is to blame and punish that person. This theory of blame and punishment raises difficult philosophical questions about how and why punishment should be accepted as a requirement of morality and justice. By the theory of own criteria, wrongdoing is not enough. A person who deserves punishment must be culpable for her wrongdoing. But what does this mean? One way to think about it is that the wrongdoer's choice says something about her that implies that she deserves punishment. Retributive justice depends on an inference from the badness of the criminal act to the badness of the person who committed it in some respect that calls for punishment. But what licenses this inference? The legal process does not tell us. The question before the law is whether the defendant committed a crime. Though the law requires proof that the defendant acted voluntarily and with some level of awareness as to the nature and possible consequences of her criminal conduct, this assessment is thin. It falls short of an evaluation of the defendant's morally faulty motives, attitudes, and reasoning of the sort that is often taken by retributivists to establish a defendant's moral deservingness of punishment. At least, as I've argued el elsewhere at length, the legal basis of criminal guilt opens room for skeptical doubt about whether or to what extent we should infer moral blameworthiness from criminal guilt, much less whether to accept a view of justice according to which the state should harm the criminal actor. Restorative justice avoids this problem because the aim of restorative justice is not punitive. The restorative justice procedure does not concern itself with how much punishment a person deserves. Instead, its focus is on the responsible party's potential to negotiate and enact a reparative agreement. Let me restate this critical point, which I'm claiming is paradigm shifting. Restorative justice supposes that when a person has wronged another person, accountability for the wrong is established by the fact that the, wrong, the responsible party is now capable of recognizing and redressing it. Furthermore, holding a person accountable is a collaborative process that begins with an accounting of what happened and a willingness on the part of the wrongdoer to listen to accounts of the impact of the crime on the victim. From there, possible modes of repair are mutually considered by the participants to the con conference. The process is not concerned with how badly the wrongful act reflects on the wrongdoer as a person or how much moral blame she deserves for what she's done. The affected party's thoughts and feelings about these matters may well arise in the restorative justice dialogue, but it's not the task of, the restor of restorative justice to adjudicate them. Moral responses to the wrongdoing are primarily oriented to enhancing and facilitating the responsible person's capacity for acknowledgement, redress, and personal growth. Blame does not attach to the person as such, nor is it used, is it treated as an expression of the condemnatory treatment the wrongdoer deserves. The responsible party must be capable of engaging in the restorative process. But as I've indicated, he or she is helped by the support and understanding of other participants. 
It's plausible to think that a capacity for empathy is also required for restorative justice to occur. With the exception of some personality disorders, however, emp empathy is typically cultivated through the kind of ethical dialogue and perspective taking that is structured as a restorative justice encounter. It requires the criminal long wrongdoer to confront the injuries the victim has suffered. This may be emotionally difficult. As one young man put it, hands shaking after apologizing to the person he assaulted and robbed, you know, for all I've done and all that's been done to me, apologizing is the scariest shit I ever did. The experience of empathy, understanding, and a sense of community that emerges through restorative justice often surprises participants. So we can articulate the concept of moral accountability required by restorative justice. Criminal defendants are morally accountable when they're capable of engaging in a restorative justice conversation and through it of coming to acknowledge and redress their wrongful conduct. Generally speaking, people who have been convicted of crimes are morally competent to do this. And their competence is strengthened by the structure and support of the Restorative Justice Conference. This paradigm shift in how to think about account accountability from culpability and punishment to reparative agency is powerful. It allows us to avoid puzzling questions about moral desert and to focus instead on the importance of moral repair and how it might be accomplished. The second dimension of the paradigm shift exemplified by restorative justice concerns its analysis of obstacles to accountability. Rather than conceptualizing the primary obstacle to accountability as the character defect and unreformability of the criminal actor, the criminal actor is treated like the victim as an injured person. A common restorative justice refrain is hurt people, hurt people. I wanna propose a particular take on this refrain. My focus will be on the moral injury suffered by those who wrongfully harm others. The notion of moral injury as a concept developed by psychologists originated in the psychological diagnosis and treatment of traumatized veterans of war. It refers to psychological injuries resulting from a betrayal of what's right. More specifically, moral injury refers to psychological injury caused by perpetrating, failing to prevent, or witnessing acts that transgress deeply held moral beliefs and expectations. The ensuing research program is focused on modeling moral injury as a kind of psychological distress that has not been adequately incorporated into familiar clinical approaches to trauma. PTSD therapies focus on interventions designed to correct a trauma sufferer's false beliefs or distorted feelings. This includes exposure therapy, in which a therapist helps the traumatized patient to tolerate situations that provoke fear but do not warrant it, and cognitive processing therapy that helps a patient to modify unwarranted beliefs. Moral injury researchers hypothesize that these therapies may fail to address dimensions of a person's suffering caused by moral wrongdoing. The notion of moral injury has several layers, as we will see. Let's begin with the core idea, which is that wrongdoing injures the agent of the wrongdoing. Criminal violation injures not only the victim, but also the wrongdoer. Furthermore, the injury to the wrongdoer is moral. But what does it mean to say that a wrongdoer is morally injured by his or her wrongful agency? This is not so clear in the clinical psychology literature. Drawing on work in the ethics of agency, I will explore a possible answer. Let's begin with the idea of personhood. A person is a human being with a reflective awareness of self that arises through the exercise of agency, that is, in acting. This idea has been insightfully developed by philosophers Harry Frankfurt Gary Watson, and Christine Korsgaard. 
The idea is that personhood involves awareness of what moves one to act. This does not imply that one chooses or controls one's motives, but that they represent something the agent finds important. More strongly put, personhood involves identifying with the grounds of one's action, namely with a piece of normative reasoning about what one is doing. One decides to align oneself with a story about why one acts. To grasp this point, we must appreciate the difference between acting and something's merely happening to or within you. An involuntary activity like breathing is not an action. Neither is falling down when it's accidental or caused by a push. Habits are a harder, harder case, especially when they're not self-conscious. By contrast, in acting, an agent commits herself self-consciously to considerations that make sense of what she's doing an agent makes sense of her conduct by rationalizing it or justifying it by understanding her decision to do something as a response to reasons. Normative considerations, reasons, can be expressed in general form like this. In circumstances C, I shall do A for reason R. In this sense, every action has a principle. In committing to a principle, that is by acting for some reason R, the agent also commits to the relevance of reason R as a ground for acting in similar circumstances. In other words, I shall do A for reason R in circumstances C involves a generalization. A commitment to a principle of action of the form, I shall do A for reason R in circumstances C, generates rational pressure on the agent to behave consistently over time in similar circumstances unless the agent finds reason to change her mind. On this analysis of the relationship between agency and personhood, a person is a creature whose actions are guided with self-awareness and consistency over time by an exercise in reflection about what he or she is doing. We might even say that the human psyche seeks meaning in experience in this way. If successful, a human being who seeks meaning and experience stands for something through the exercise of his or her agency. What the agent stands for emerges from a temporally extended profile of her self-conscious decisions about how to conduct herself. So let's call what the agent stands for the agent's enacted principles. Now, acting in a way that violates one's enacted principles without sufficient reason is injurious to a self-conscious being. I'm not here referring to minor transgressions or inconsistencies. I'm talking about violations which the agent cannot justify to herself of her core principles. Violating principles with which you identify alienates you from your own personhood. It disrupts one's sense of self. A person who violates principles she has laid down for herself, that is, a person who violates principles she's acted on for reasons she takes to be important, becomes disunified or fragmented over time. That person's story becomes hard to tell. Her conduct cannot be justified in the terms of her own thinking. Her conduct lacks meaning from her perspective, which may also make it hard to explain. We might say that such a person lacks integrity. So we've arrived at the idea of a certain kind of injury, namely, namely to the integrity of a person. In other words, an injury to personhood. But we have not yet arrived at the idea of moral injuries. To understand it, we need to draw out a moral dimension of personal identity. We can do this by expanding the sense in which a moral person is self-aware. Acting on moral principles makes you into a person who has a community, a sense of community with other human beings as such, since it is the personhood of others which morality demands that we respect. Moral agency involves conducting oneself in a way that can be justified to other persons. This calls for moral reasoning, for example, to evaluate the relative benefits and burdens imposed by other, 
on other people by one's course of action. An agent's course of conduct should be one that others cannot reasonably reject. Perhaps it's not always possible to conduct oneself in this way, but the aspiration to do it is critical to moral personhood. It expands the relevant sense in which a, an agent is self-aware to include the perspective of other people and how one's conduct affects them. Now we arrive at the idea that violating moral principles is injurious to a self-conscious being who, through his or her moral commitments, stands in community with other persons as such. It produces moral alienation. Why? The wrongful agent is caught in the contradiction of, on the one hand, affirming principles he or she takes to be justifiable to others and on the other, acting in ways that are not justifiable to others. This cognitive dissonance disrupts a person's self-conception in a way that causes pain. A person who suffers moral injury may experience guilt from treating others in ways that cannot be justified to them. And in addition to other directed guilt is the shame of violating one's own valued principles. Shame leads to hiding, efforts to avoid the source of shame and to dissociate oneself from it. This may lead a person to withdraw from interpersonal relationships and more broadly from involvement in society. Shame may also play out in forms of self-deception that include psychological dissociation and related memory impairments. A self-deceiving agent does not confront disruptions to her sense of self caused by violating her moral principles. Instead, she dissociates herself from her conduct and places it out of the reach of her self-conscious reflection. Self-isolation and psychological dissociation, while uncomfortable in themselves, also have further deleterious effects that may include depression, suicidal ideation, self-harm, substance abuse, lack of trust in other people, and decreased empathy. Anger at experiencing moral distress can increase a person's propensity to violence. These are documented symptoms of trauma. Understanding these symptoms is enhanced by viewing them as expressions of moral injury. It is possible, of course, that some responsible parties do not experience shame or guilt because they lack awareness that their conduct has wrongfully injured others. They may lack awareness because they have avoided it or because they subscribe to values that are in some respect antisocial. And with a history of trauma, for example, may experience a fragmented self, sense of self and an impaired capacity to reflect. The restorative justice process is designed to help such a person come to an awareness they may previously have lacked by confronting them with the testimony of persons they've injured. In that sense, the restorative justice process is designed to cause, cause the responsible party pain, but this should not be confused with retributive punishment. Causing psychological pain is not the aim of restorative justice. Restorative justice aims to bring responsible parties to an awareness of their wrongdoing not for the pain it causes them, but to equip them to redress their wrongdoing. Feelings of moral distress, whether these feelings precede or are caused by the restorative justice conversation, remain unresolved for the morally injured person as long as him, his or her own wrongdoing is unexamined. Until and unless the wrong is examined and responded to, retaining a sense of self in relation to others as persons will require the wrongdoer to live with alienation to some degree from his or her recognition of their personhood. After all, recognizing the personhood of others and the claims that it is what the morally injured person reco recoils from. But treating human beings as other than persons involves lying to oneself. Recognizing this, helps to deepen our understanding of moral injury. Moral injury is the self-alienation of living in avoidance and denial of the source of one's psychic injury and distress, 
where the source of injury, injury and distress is one's own wrongful conduct. Clinicians find that persons who acknowledge and respond to guilt are much closer to recovery than those who are trapped by and struggle with their own shame. Underlying shame, however, that has transformative potential. As I see it, the practice of restorative justice applies a framework of moral injury to persons who have committed crimes. Great effort is made in the restorative justice conversation to contextualize a responsible person's guilt and shame, to consider not only the fact of what he or she has done, but also aspects of the responsible party's life situation that may yield an understanding of his or her wrongful choices. Efforts are made with compassionate engagement to relieve the responsible party of her shame enough to enable her to explore her wrongdoing and to think about how to redress it. The, pr the prospect that there is something the responsible party can do to redress the wrong also helps to relieve the distress of shame and guilt. Support from other people is offered by amplifying the investment participants in the restorative co justice conversation have in its success. This is done by building a sense of community. Now let's complicate the picture. In a structurally unjust society, individual wrongdoing takes place in a social and political context in which the wrongdoer may himself have been wronged. This is primarily what restorative justice practitioners have in mind when they say, hurt people, hurt people. It will be obvious to anyone who studies the demographics of the incarcerated population and reads their testimonies that this is the case. Our prisons are filled with people who have had hard lives, in many ways through no fault of their own. They tend to be people who, have, who are socially marginalized and have little access to resources and opportunities. They are poor. They are disproportionately the descendants of American slavery. Many have themselves been victims of violence. As one restorative justice practitioner testified, before I committed my first crime, many, many crimes were committed against me. The first time I felt human, the first time I felt seen was in a circle. Someone asked me, what's your story? What have you been through? How do you feel? The prevalence of poverty, a history of violence and abuse, and the deprivation of vital opportunities describe the life circumstances of the segment of our population most likely to land in prison. An implication of these facts is that the person who's been convicted of a serious crime may experience a layered sense of betrayal and alienation. That person experiences not only the injury of self-betrayal a moral person experiences in wronging another, but also the betrayal of having been wrongfully injured by the society to which he or she belongs. As I will now show, we can extend the concept of moral injury to encompass the layered sense of betrayal we are now considering. Psychologist Jonathan Shea defines moral injury to include betrayal of what's right by someone in a position of rightful authority. This includes being subjected to immoral authoritative commands in a military context. I think he's right about the injurious nature of this kind of betrayal. More generally, I would say that a sense of betrayal accompanies the experience of injustice. The injuries of injustice are not mere hardships. They take on moral meaning when they are deprivations of resources, opportunities, and protections a person correctly perceives he is entitled to. Unjust deprivations represent failures of reigning institutions, institutions that claim and are widely recognized to have authority. Furthermore, those injustices can be experienced by people who are treated unjustly as a betrayal not only by those in positions of authority, but also by one's fellow citizens who are obligated by justice to ensure that all members of society are treated as equals entitled to their fair share. So the moral injury, the moral dimension of injury 
we are now concerned with comes not merely from physical and emotional injury, deprivation, and disappointed need, even urgent need, but from a sense of justice. Only persons with a sense of justice are vulnerable to moral injury in the aspect I'm now exploring. I'm describing the alienation of injustice, but we must dig a little deeper to connect this experience of alienation with the injured party's agential self. Only thus will it fit into our overall account. We might reason about it in this way. The moral injury of injustice comes from recognizing the authority of other people, which is something they have only when we confer it on them. Moral injury results from another person's abuse of the authority we have granted to or recognized in them, perhaps not freely, but granted nonetheless. To that extent, their wrongful conduct is something we indirectly accept by having granted to them authority that they misuse. Unless we repudiate it, their authority is in effect premised on an aspect of our own self-conception say as an American or as a citizen of what's alleged to be a democracy or as a child of a particular parent or a member of a congregation or a student in a university or someone that works for a firm organization or government. These aspects, aspects of identity express an acceptance of one's relative position within a structured relationship that depends on authority confirming norms. To be clear, I'm not describing relationships of brute power and domination, but rather authority, which depends to some degree on cooperation. Arguably, the democratic relationship between equal citizens and morality itself is structured in this way, where what is involved is a reciprocal recognition of authority. Cooperating with injustice, even passively and indirectly, is demoralizing. It displays a kind of willing or unwilling complicity. It pits the cooperator against his or her own sense of justice, which is injurious in the ways I've been describing. We may add, a, add to this picture a layer of obfuscation that deepens the injury. A moral injury that stems from injustice may be disorienting when it lacks public recognition. A polity tends to affirm its identity in idealized terms. It abstracts from the imperfections of its institu institutions and from their history of injustice, which may lead to distorted representations of the actual social order. A distorted representation may produce a disorienting experience of unreality for those whose social position is misrepresented. W.E.B. Du Bois captures this brilliantly in his diagnosis and description of what he calls the double consciousness of Black Americans. After asking devastatingly, how does it feel to be a problem? He writes, it is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity, one ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unre unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals trapped in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Du Bois is describing a feeling of alienation that can be understood as underscoring the injuries inflicted on him and other Black Americans by the public non-recognition of injustice and its accompanying misrepresentation of the Black American experience. I've been examining the idea that a responsible party, someone who has committed a crime, is, an in, is injured both through the violation of his or her own conscience and by those in authority who've treated that person unjustly and deny their own injustice. I follow Du Bois in considering the peculiar sensation that may be engendered by the latter sort of injury. The moral injury of injustice may yield 
a disorienting sense of unreality when it is masked. In the criminal justice context, I think moral, the moral injury of injustice is masked by philosophical ideas about responsibility, blame, and the point of punishment. Let me explain what I mean. Personal responsibility is the lens through which a criminal justice system presents the problem of crime and its remedies. Holding a defendant individually responsible involves abstracting from his or her social situation, including institutional injustice. The question taken up by, taken up by a criminal court is simply, did this defendant commit a crime? What is not investigated is the defendant's history and life situation, including a possible history of violence and abuse or lack of access to resources to meet his or her basic needs. Well, meaning is, however, ascribed to findings of criminal guilt. Moral blame is directed at persons who are convicted of crimes. Blame involves an inference from act to person. It concerns what the criminal act says about the person, morally speaking. Blame says it's not only the act, but the person who is bad. There's more to the story. Blame is an inference from criminal conviction that's rationalized by the point of punishment. It's the task of giving blameworthy wrongdoers the punishment they deserve. Thus, Inferring moral blameworthiness from criminal guilt is justified by the point of punishment. If the agent is punishable, then he's blameworthy. Now let's color this picture. American society is a society in which awareness of color-coded caste identity is acute. This awareness is reinforced by the practice of criminal law enforcement. Here are some of the things we know. Law enforcement officials more aggressively police black neighborhoods. This may not be surprising since poor inner city neighborhoods have higher violent crime rates, yet aggressive policing extends beyond a response to serious crimes and may even ignore them. The popular broken windows policing policy focuses on low level crimes on the theory that crimes like public drunkenness, loitering and vandalism attract other more serious crimes. Broken windows policing is more common in neighborhood, neighborhoods that have higher proportions of Black and Latino residents, resulting in more police encounters and opportunities for arrest. 75 to 80% of arrests overall are for, are for misdemeanors. Researchers at John Jay College who analyzed data from the early 2000s to the late 2010s in seven US cities found an approximately three to seven times higher rate of arrest for black suspects in comparison with white suspects for misdemeanor offenses. The researchers co correlated this rate with targeted policing, that is with concentrated policing in black neighborhoods. They also questioned the hypothesis that higher misdemeanor arrest rates are causally related to a decrease in the violent crime rate, a causal claim that has been challenged as well by several other recent studies. Studies have also documented higher arrest rates for black, black suspects in general, while controlling for the seriousness of offenses and the suspect's prior criminal record. We know prosecutors more aggressively charge black suspects and that black suspects are more likely to be deprived of adequate legal representation because they're disproportionately poor. This leads to higher conviction rates. There's also evidence of jury bias and evidence that black defendants are more harshly sent sentenced across all types of crimes and including capital offenses. These practices send a message. In our criminal law culture of blame, they convey judgments of increased blameworthiness. In the language of the common law, they suggest the defendant's greater depravity and malice. In more modern language, they suggest the defendant is more dangerous and poses a greater threat to the public. The result is that criminal conviction confers a harsher stigma on defendants who are members of the color-coded bottom caste. 
And not only that, criminal convi conviction casts stigma on members of the bottom caste group in general. This is because it is the defendant's racial group identity rather than his criminal conduct that attracts more punitive attitudes and responses. In a self-fulfilling identity tracking practice, in a self-fulfilling cycle, identity tracking practices of punishment merge distinctions between act, person, and group and reinforce the perception that punitive treatment is deserved. Now we are in a position more fully to address the question whether by focusing responsibility talk individually and interpersonally, restorative justice threatens to legitimize institutional injustice. Here's what I think is important. Though restorative justice does not directly address racial bias in law enforcement or the group-based effects of stigmatizing individual defendants, nor does it correct background distributive injustice, but it does disrupt, disrupt the inference from the badness of the criminal act to the badness of the criminal agent, and by extension, the inference from act to person to group. It does this by rejecting retributive thinking and by orienting the practice of accountability in a reparative direction. While this orientation is not a solution to problems of institutional and social injustice, it is a resource for modeling a different kind of society and one that is well within our collective reach. So here's a summary of the lessons that I've gleaned from the practice of restorative justice. Restorative justice is an exercise in communicative ethics that potentially benefits both perpetrators and victims of crimes. Moral injury to the wrongdoer by his or her wrongdoing must be addressed so the responsible party can heal and the wrongdoing will, be, will not be repeated. Moral injury to wrongdoers by their society's unjust mistreatment of them must be addressed by societal efforts to achieve distributive justice. We have strong reasons not only to punish less, but also to change the way we think about the point of criminal justice. Thank you. Thank you, Erin, that was marvelous. Um, so we have a little bit of flexibility, so we'll go into 20 after six. We'll take that as a hard stop. Let us begin with questions from students. Yeah, please, uh, and say what your name is. This was a great talk. Um, so my question was, it strikes me a lot of practitioners of restorative justice. So like I'm thinking like Daniel Sered characterized the practice as survivor centered. Yeah. Um, and then you could also think of another kind of moral theory of restorative justice being work of like Margaret Irvin Walker. And I feel like also she tends to take a very sort of victim centric look at what is morally at stake when we're engaging in restorative justice. It's kind of restoring the victim's confidence in kind of moral standards of the community. Um, and so I thought it was striking that your theory of what's going on in restorative justice is so um, responsible party, or your, your sort of focus on responsible parties so much more. So I'm wondering whether your view, you see it as that tension with these other kinds of survivor-centric accounts or mm -hmm. maybe supplementary? Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a good question and, and an interesting question. And, and I agree that the practice overall is victim-centered, victim-oriented, victim-responsive. Um, and so I, I don't really disagree with that as a description of restorative justice, um, but I did want to highlight the possible benefits to perpetrators as, as well, um, especially since some of these organizations that work with people over weeks, you know, before the final circle, they're meeting regularly with the perpetrator to try to get this person to 
deliver on the agreement to do what he or she's supposed to do and helping that person to, to follow through. So there's some close work being done with, with the, you know, the responsible, the responsible party. So I don't think there's an incompatibility between um, the victim responsiveness and the sort of benefits of the collaborative work to the perpetrator. And it seems like the, the benefits are related, right? Insofar as, you know, what, when, when victims talk about sort of the helpfulness of restorative justice, it's, um, it's often through their compassionate connection with the responsible party who, in ways that they didn't expect that flows from that person coming to acknowledge the wrong, to talk about it, to listen to them, right? And it's the very same thing that also can be beneficial to the, to the perpetrator. So it's a certain kind of conversation in which each party is taking the perspective of the other, trying to understand, listen, speaking to the other, you know, in this kind of dialogical way that brings this mutual benefit. So, um, so I, yes, I, I, I kind of, I did think, oh, maybe I should speak more to the benefit to, benefit to victims, but I do think it's there, and that it, whatever benefit the perpetrator gets isn't doesn't detract from that, and that it's the same sort of, I don't know, approach and technique that is mutually beneficial. Another student? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Andy, and introduce yourself. yourself. Yeah, my name is Andy. Uh, I'm an undergraduate here. Um, I'm wondering to what degree you think that your account is contingent upon, like, psychologically what is true. Like, it seems like a lot of what you talked to us about, about the moral harms that are done to the individuals who uh, commit these acts, seems to deal with their recognition of the fact that they have committed a wrong. Like, perhaps we might think of cases in which individuals might have personality disorders or some other situation where they don't necessarily recognize that they're, you know, there's a lack of comportment to some sort of moral code or other sorts of reasons that they might endure. But I'm just wondering, yeah. in your view, like how that would fit into your picture. I think that some people aren't capable of engaging in restorative justice conversations, that kind of ethical conversation and, you know, following through in, in the right way. So it's not going to work for everyone. But I, but I don't think, I don't think that a person has to come into it with an already reflective awareness of, you know, the wrong and its impact on the victim, they can learn about that in through the process. And um, and I am supposing that there, you know, there's an empirical psychology to sort of the impact of going through that process with another person that, you know, that that psychologists describe, and it seems plausible to me. Um, but if it if it turns out not to be true that people respond, you know, sy sympathetically, compassionately, in in a way that uh, you know is healing to each party through this kind of conversation, then it, that would be a serious problem for for the for the view. Um, so I do think it's limited. You know, not everyone will be capable of or interested in it, and or you know, be willing. To, to, to do this. Um, so it's hard to think of it as a kind of re replacement, you know, for the criminal justice system. Um, but it does seem worth exploring as an alternative to more punitive responses in a wide range of cases. Um, yes, thanks. Kate? I want to follow up a little bit on that question and ask about white collar crimes by rich white guys. Mm -hmm. Because with all of the diagnosis you've had of um, being more sympathetic to the was grounded in the idea that the perpetrator was himself or herself a victim of um, an injury from an uh, unjust society and all of that. There's a huge amount of white collar crime by people who do not strike me as having been particularly injured. Yeah. So. Right. So what's the I mean, are we going to be able to do the same thing there, or do we really need this this sort of um, grounding in a particular what might have been the running star? So it, it I take your point, and I think we would I think it's going to depend on the type of person. 
you know, whether this is this is an option and whether it would be beneficial. So it's still possible that this person who's privileged in many ways is injured in the sense of, you know, um, of having violated some ethical ideas that it's some some sense of responsibility to other people. This person may be capable of feeling guilt or shame about their behavior, um, or maybe they're not. Maybe it's the type of person that um, the last questioner seemed to have in mind, a kind of so sociopathic type of person who isn't going to be responsive to um, sort of the, you know, in, in, an, in an ethical way to the testimony of other people whose life savings this guy ripped off or, you know, crushed or they lost their home. So, but, you know, I, I think there are probably plenty of white collar criminals out there that might not feel too good about confronting some of their victims um, and um, have some incentive to um, own up to what they've done and try to make it better. Okay, I mean, are there two elements? Maybe let me separate it a little bit. Or I try to put the other. But um, the um, one is the you know what might happen to this perpetrator, whoever he or she is, regardless of background, and that's a uh, as you say, good work. Um, but the other was the story you told about why we should have compassion for the perpetrator for all your injuries. Mm -hmm. And that's the part where I'm wondering whether you're actually going to have a good copy. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, 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 answer the question fully in the abstract, but it, it's certainly possible that a kind of effort at restorative justice um, would not provoke a compassionate response by the victims vis-a-vis -vis the perpetrator who's a powerful person and has misused his or her authority. And that points to a limit to the benefit of restorative justice in those cases. But if the person is does is actually contrite or motivated and motivated to do something, you know, to redress the harm. There may be things that person can do that would be beneficial to um, to to the victims. So um, I recognize that it's harder to feel compassion for somebody who's abused their position of privilege and authority, but um, that's not the only element of the restorative justice. Um, dialogue and kind of contract. Um, that's not even part of the contract, but you know, it's it's not. It, it it seems like there are other ways in which there could be beneficial outcomes. Let's take a question uh, from our online audience. Sure. So this is a question related to Ava's first question and comes from a practitioner, Margaret Cedar, who practices medicine at the VA, and asks: Is restorative justice appropriate for all forms of wrongdoing? For instance, can it be re-victimizing for victims of domestic violence? And did the use of surrogate victims help in this matter? And any other thoughts that you have on how to ensure equitable access to restorative justice? Yes, um, it, it, it's an important question, and I'm I'm not I, I'm not endorsing it for all circumstances and in, in crimes. Um, and I think that. I mean, in, you know, I'm just learning about this There's and, and exploring the empirical work on this. So I think there's a lot to be learned that is important to think about in addressing that, that kind of question. I think the use of surrogate victims can be effective and especially when victims don't wanna participate and a perpetrator does. Um, so that's helpful. Some, some restorative justice organizations won't take on sexual assault cases. Um, for these kinds of reasons that they're worried about uh, re-traumatizing the victim. Um, but on college campuses, there's been some effort to, um, to bring a restorative justice possibility with regard to even, you know, campus, ca campus sexual assault allegations and um, attempt to, res to resolve them in that way. And so I, I don't have an, you know, I don't have a firm view about about whether that's a good thing, um, but I'm open to you know thinking and le learning about it. Um, 
I was wondering about the idea of accountability as reparative agency um, and that it might make space for third parties to assume in as much as they have a kind of reparative agency, they have the power of the <clears throat> capability of, yeah. of repairing to assume accountability or to take accountability even when they weren't the primary yeah. or the responsible party. I mean, there's, there's a version of this, which is an objection, which is not maybe the mm -hmm. version of the question I'm most interested in where the objection version is, look, sort of the notion of accountability as a reparative agency threatens to treat symmetrically people who have equal standing to repair, but who do not have equal responsibility for the wrong. But there's also a more interesting part of this is I think just the kind of interesting possibility about um, the space for third parties to take accountability or to assume responsibility um, yeah. when when they want to or when they can. So I was wondering if you had any. Yeah, any I think that's that. really interesting. Um, and it is a model in which res accountability, responsibility is shared in some way through this collaborative process. Um, so I think I think that's you know that that the kind of interpersonal or collective aspect of accountability taking is an interesting thing to explore. And I think it connects connects with some analyses of um, the phenomenon of forgiveness, where there's this sense that the forgiver is sharing and you know, take taking on some of the responsibility by absorbing, you know, some some of the, well, it, it's it's hard to say exactly how to put it, but you know, sort of um, ending their complaint in a way against against the person who's hurt them, and in that way taking on some of um, taking on board some of what might have been assigned solely to the the injurer. Um, so I think there's a nice connection there with sort of thinking about forgiveness and its relationship to restorative restorative justice. So I like the question. It seems fruitful. Sorry. Thanks so much. Thanks for the talk. Um, okay, here, here's something that I think I would still love to be able to say. Um, I think I would love to be able to say that a huge part of the problem with the American carceral system as it currently stands is that it punishes people who aren't blameworthy. And it punishes people way out of proportion to the heavily mitigated minimal degree of blameworthiness that some have. And it fails to punish a ton of folks who are blameworthy, like some of those black collar criminals that mentioned, like Rich Picolucci on their taxes and so forth. Can I still say, like, some version of something resembling that if I give up on retributivism and go in for restorative justice? Or do I have to say something totally different? Like, can I still mount that criticism? Um. Yeah, I, I I think you can. I mean, it depends what you want want to say about how the criminal justice system should handle some some of these cases. Um, so we'd have to dig into that a little bit more. Um, but um, I mean, what? So I mean, there. I'm I'm hesitating because part of the problem of the kind of lack of blameworthiness um, of many people caught up in the criminal justice system is a challenge to restorative justice insofar as the restorative justice, like the whole thing gets started with an admission of guilt. Now, you know, I tried to say, well, that doesn't mean keeping on the blame and we're separating the act from the person, but it still is premised on this idea that somebody did something wrong. And there are a lot of people who have done things that shouldn't be criminalized. And in that sense, there, there shouldn't, you shouldn't even, you know, like the, the, the premise should, shouldn't get going, right? Or there, you know, maybe the, the extent to which they're not blameworthy, depending on what you mean by blameworthy, also undermines the idea that what they've done was wrong. So now we have a kind of challenge to the premise of the restorative justice conversation, and that is a complication. <laughs> um, so um, it's it's a hard question to answer in, in a way that's sensitive to that set of considerations. And I think related to that is a worry that, um, that using restorative justice because it's less punitive can have the consequence of putting into the system, if we're talking about diversionary programs within the criminal justice system, kinds of charges that might have otherwise been dismissed like it's not worth punishing this person, but oh, we could send them to restorative justice. Now we've got a kind of net widening and that could be a problem. 
Um, so I know that's not exactly what you're asking, but my thinking kind of went in that direction. Let's take one more question from Nicholas. Sure, this is from Nicholas Barra, who asks, at the end of your talk, you concluded by saying that restorative justice is a form of communicative ethics. Do you think this could be extended to other forms of alternative dispute resolution, negotiation, mediation, et cetera, um, and other instances from which we can start grounding communicative ethics based on conflict management resolution? And if so, what would be some of the particularities of this kind of communicative ethics? Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question. It does, restorative justice does share with mediation and other forms of dialogue um, certain features of sort of, and in a way, like Habermas's communicative ethics captures this nicely too. The idea of the equal equality of each participant, a response to each person's contribution that is um, is is reason sensitive. Um, so a kind of it's a kind of rational dialogue um, between people who are similarly positioned with an equal. Um, entitlement to participate and kind of equitable time. And so the, that that model of communicative ethics, yes, overlaps with other forms of, um, you know, alternative dispute mediation and um, and 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 um, and dialogue, which I, I think is fruitful to recognize. Let's gather three questions and then we have to stop. So Esteban? Yes. And uh, then uh, is that Lucas? Yeah. Lucas. And then uh, Jim. So I wanted to ask really briefly, because in, in Lewis of Blade, you say that the law has to track morality for its own legitimacy at the same time. But there is a point, I think, in your um, restorative justice model you've been presenting today where you kind of strip morality from the law and instead lay it more on the, end of, on the, the personal relationship, the connection between us, and to say the law really has no place per se. Mm -hmm. And so I was curious, you know, how you kind of balance that yeah. place here. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So I, I think that the, the standards of criminal law, you know, the prohibitions of criminal law should track things that, you know, their prohibitions, prohibitions on behavior that's wrongful in some way, that there's reason to criminalize. It's important that 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 sort of that that the um that what counts as a crime it connects with what's Wrong, that with wrongful behavior in the right way, and it's not too sweeping, and it's um, not not you know um, too thin. So the connection with morality in the legitimacy of the law, as I as I'm thinking about it, is about standards of conduct. Right, right you know what standard standard of conduct is used to evaluate behavior is wrongful, but the practice of kind of um, of, of blame and accountability. In, in is interpersonal in a way that I think um, can be somewhat, it's what I'm trying to describe here, um, you know, pulled apart from the adjudication of whether a person committed a crime, you know, sort of that whether, whether they're guilty of a crime. So there's a moral standard in both domains. One is a standard of conduct that the state, if it is, Justified is justified in enforcing. And the other is a kind of um, a moral meaning making of a wrongful conduct that calls for a certain kind of dialogue and accountability, which um, is very hard to institutionalize and to generalize and to have, you know, a, a kind of formula for, because it's so um, it's it's so variable depending on the people and what they value and what they're looking for and what they need. So it seems like some of the work of ethics should be more personal and interpersonal, but there could be there are standards of conduct that in, in a just state, you know, would help to protect our basic rights and interests. Lucas and then Dick has the last question. So I, I was wondering what you would say to an objection that I'm imagining to the part of your argument that says that um, criminal justice and restorative justice should be separated, not just from the punitive element, but also from um, judgments of blame and blameworthiness. And the objection would say that there may well be quite a deep connection between uh, judgments of blameworthiness and moral healing, because one way to um, help a wrongdoer, especially a habitual wrongdoer, to heal is to help them recognize that 
and why they are blameworthy, and that that can be done without trying, even attempting to punish, but through through other methodological means. Yeah. So the objection would say this looks like a good argument to rethink the punitive element of the contributive justice, but perhaps not giving up on judgments of blameworthiness as part yes. of the it, possibly depending on what you mean by blameworthiness. I mean, so it's a concept that can is interpreted by different people in different ways. So if what it means to be worthy of blame is to deserve a certain response, we and that may be a punitive response on some views. On other views, maybe it's a wider array of responses. It's still sort of focused on the response owed to the person, which I just don't see as the primary focus of that restorative conversation. Although I can see your argument that unless the person, and, and, I, and I am trying to say this as well, unless the person takes accountability of their wrong, acknowledges the wrong and the need to do something, right? It's not gonna work. So is that accepting blameworthiness? I think it depends on how we spell out the notion. What is it that they're worthy of? Usually that's framed in a kind of response oriented way. Uh, you know, like what other, how other people should respond to them or would be, have a reason to respond to them. But the, the focus here is more on accountability in, um, in a, you know, in the direction of redressing the wrong. So um, whether there's a connection between acknowledgement and blame, I think will depend on how we spell out the concept of blame and what, how much work it's doing and what weight, you know, sort of what its grip is, what is it, what are, what are, what is it connected to? So that's a wiggly answer, but maybe we can talk more about it. Yeah, afterwards. Yeah. Do you want a hard stop at 6.20? No, it's okay. Okay. Well, it was so rich. There was so much going on. I'm not sure that I got everything. In fact, I'm sure that I didn't. But if I follow the argument uh, correctly, there are actually two pieces to it that are quite different. One, uh, we should be avoiding uh, retributive attitudes towards punishment because it's unfair or unjust. Um, and moving to restorative justice is one way of avoiding uh, that injustice. But the other part of the argument is restorative justice is actually likely to do quite a lot of good. Uh, and it's likely to do a lot of good along at least three uh, dimensions. First, to the perpetrator. Second, to the victim, if it's done uh, well and works uh, correctly. And then third, in our society, it may have some restorative uh, effect in equalizing um, making more appropriate attitudes towards different social uh, groups. So am I right that yeah. there are these all these pieces uh, yeah. of the argument? And if so, uh, am I further right that it would be a sort of complicated semi-balancing uh, sort of problem to try to figure out uh, whether restorative justice was appropriate in any particular case so that it might be less unjust to be doing retributive justice with respect to the white collar uh, criminal and might be more uh, urgent to be doing restorative justice with respect uh, to uh, a case uh, in which the perpetrator is somebody who is a member of a disadvantaged uh, group and so forth. So this might not turn out well. Yeah, that's a nice, it's it's a nice point that you're making in the form of a question that connects with the earlier discussion that I was having with Kate and um, the the conversation before that. It's 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 possible that it would be less unjust in those cases to deliver retributive justice, but I think we would still need an argument for the value of retributive justice um, in any case. Um, and I'm skeptical about that, but the idea of it being less unjust when the, um, you know, the, the, the social circumstances that are mi mitigating of some relevant notion of, of blame don't mitigate in this case um, is a point that, that, you know, has some plausibility. So, um, yes, I, I accept your point. Um, with the caveat that you know the, the the justification of retribution in itself is still a challenge for 
um, I think the retributive justice theorist. So there's a double barreled thank you that we need to offer. So please wait for the second one. The first one, Erin, so I don't need much persuading, persuading that a lot of punishment simply isn't deserved, but praise can be deserved. And we want to <laughs> praise you for a marvelous talk. So please thank you. This is so And the second shoe is this is Daniel Allen's last public lecture. Danielle is stepping down from being our magnificent director after seven years. Seven years. It seemed eight, it, it did seem longer than that. In <laughs> the most most marvelous way. So Danielle, you, you've been such a marvelous story. And so rather selfishly, you're moving most of your base of operations to the Kennedy School. So you know, we'll we'll still see each other all the time. But we will miss you as director of the Sapper Center. So thank you for your years of devotion and service. There was a perfect lecture to be my last lecture. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And as you know, these are issues very close to my heart. And as Dick said, it was an incredibly rich lecture and very ambitious. So there's a lot more to talk about, but I really appreciate the ambition of it. Thank well. you very much. Yeah. Some of it's very